Center. Welcome, and I'll uh, turn the floor over to Ellen to introduce our speaker for today. I'm Ellen Ryan, and I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Ron Becker uh, from the University of Toronto Computer Science Department, Emeritus Chair and, um, and Inventor on behalf of older adults, uh, applying uh, the newest of technologies to helping older adults, especially those experiencing uh, uh, sensory and cognitive uh, uh, and, uh, difficulties in continuing to maintain communication with, uh, uh, with their families and continuing to engage in activities that, that really matter. So without further ado, Dr. Becker. Thank you, Alan. That was a, a wonderful introduction. Uh, no recitation of <laughs> appointments and honors. People can find all that on the internet. Thank you. Um, to start the timer so I can keep track of uh, my time here. Okay, um, how many of you are profs or uh, emeritus profs? Uh, how many of you are PhD students? How many of you are master's students? How many of you are undergraduates? Okay, good, well we've got a good spectrum. Um, how many of you are I'm sorry, I don't know all the departments here. Call out departments that you're in. Uh, what department are you in? Sociology. Sociology, okay. What department are you in? Health aging. Health aging. Okay, what department are you in? Uh, health aging. Uh, psychiatry. Psychiatry. Economics. Okay. Uh, it's volunteering. Volunteering, okay. Good, all right, department. so very multidisciplinary. <laughs> Okay, so um, what I'm going to do today is um, talk to you about a variety of technologies, most of which we've had nothing to do with creating, a few that we have created, uh, that respond to some of the opportunities and challenges that arise out of the uh, increasing aging of society. Um, I'm sure this audience knows about the aging of society, but this particular uh, formulation of it from the United Nations report in 2004 I thought was particularly striking. It says in 1950, only 5% of the world population was over 65. By 2050, it'll be 16%. And by 2300, and sometimes I add if the world still exists then, um, it'll be 32 so basically that means across population as a whole, one out of every three persons will be a senior citizen. And this will be, uh, we're already at a stage now, or just about to reach, when the population of seniors in North America is equivalent to the population of children, uh, where if you appropriately define senior and child. Um, the, uh, the good news is that um, if you live long, and hopefully we'll live long, uh, get to enjoy the benefits of living long. Uh, and the bad news is that increasingly, as you get older, in order to enjoy life as a senior, you have to deal with challenges ranging from particular diseases like Alzheimer's disease, blindness, deafness, various sensory motor cognitive challenges. And a topic that we've gotten particularly interested in in the last five or six years the issues of social isolation and loneliness. Uh, and so my lab starts asking the question, can technology assist seniors? And immediately the question comes back, well, what do you mean assist? With what issues, with what problems? And so um, we have found useful um, a 1944 paper, I believe, by the psychologist Abraham Maslow on what he described as the hierarchy of human needs. And what Maslow said in this paper was, uh, at the lowest level, you start out with physiological needs. I mean, if you, um, if you don't have oxygen, if you don't have food, if you don't have water, um, if you're freezing, uh, everything else doesn't matter. You can't survive. And then he said, well, up a level, let's think about safety and security. At the next level, let's think about love, affection, 
belonging at the next level, let's think about esteem, um, uh, things that are relevant to your ego and your brain at the next level, uh, what he called self-actualization, need for a cause. And I tend to think of this as the top three levels, the heart, the mind, and the soul. Although as a computer scientist, I'm not supposed to speak about the soul, but you won't tell my colleagues. Um, so, uh, and I'm not going to try to substantiate this as the world's most rigorous theoretical formulation, other than to assert it's been useful for us in thinking about things we might do or things we might not do. Uh, we describe our work as research for the journey through life. And uh, we try to develop technology that's relevant to assisting seniors uh, from a particular point of view. And the point of view is different than the point of view taken by most computer science profs who develop assistive technology or technology for seniors. Most of my colleagues, and there are increasing numbers around the world, and some very good ones, in fact, in Toronto, uh, approach uh, their technologies or what are called artificial intelligence, computer vision, ubiquitous computing. Their goal is to make machines smarter and smarter and smaller and smaller and deploy them everywhere so they can watch out for us and watch over seniors to ensure that bad things don't happen. And this is great work to be doing. But our approach is different. We uh, try to take, for the most part, off-the-shelf technologies and uh, program them in a way that allows seniors to be more self-reliant, to um, leverage and enhance their own capabilities, and also to work with and engage family members in making their life as seniors better and more productive and um, et cetera. And so we, as the other school of research, we focus on human needs, uh, try to enable greater inclusion for seniors in society. And what we do in particular is we say, well, okay, here's a need, here's a technology. We think there's a match here and maybe we can work towards uh, developing that kind of technology, whether it's a cell phone or a tablet or internet multimedia or whatever, to uh, enable uh, something that helps with the needs. And so my students build prototypes of things. We test them a little bit in the lab. But mainly, we build them robust enough so we can actually deploy them in the field. And this means my students have to be very smart and very dedicated because most computer science students build something that works in the lab, works long enough to run a little study, and then they say, okay, I'm through with it, thank God, I'll move on with my life. Uh, we try to build things that have uh, longevity of legs. Um, and so uh, another way to think about it is think about the kinds of roles technology could play. So the best way to explain this is imagine uh, uh, one of you here has a, grand, has a grandchild, probably male, but not necessarily, uh, who skis a lot and who texts while skiing, okay? And this guy, uh, he's in Blue Mountain or, or somewhere, and he runs into something and he might have broken his leg, okay? And so they come by with a stretcher, stretcher they take him to a hospital, they x-ray his leg, um, and his leg indeed is broken. So we have used a diagnostic instrument, an x-ray. Um, then they say, okay, well, you need to get better, so you're gonna wear, you're gonna have crutches, and you're gonna get a cast. That's a prosthetic to help him heal. When he gets to a certain point a month later, or six weeks later, um, uh, maybe the cast starts to come off, and we say, okay, now you need to strengthen the leg. Uh, so he's in rehabilitation with a physiotherapist. And it's possible that you, the grandparent, might have said to your grandson, well, you know, the next time, maybe you shouldn't text while skiing, okay? If you were a parent, then never listen. Maybe as a grandparent, they'll listen. And that's a preventative intervention. So keep this in mind as I'm talking about technologies, because in some cases, we're talking about diagnosing problems. In some cases, we're talking about helping people deal with a disability or a challenge in some cases, uh, strengthening the function, rehabilitative, et cetera. 
So what I'm going to do now in the body of the talk is I'm going to go through the Maslow hierarchy from bottom to top, except here it, it's reversed. And I'm going to start talking briefly about physiological needs and safety needs, which are areas that we historically have not worked on, uh, and then talk about some projects in the three upper levels of the hierarchy. And I'm going to pay particularly attention to staying connected to family and friends, which is our biggest project right now. And I'm also going to talk a bit about this re-experiencing past identity, despite now having Alzheimer's disease, because it's one of my favorite projects, and I know Ellen is very interested in it, et cetera. OK, so let's start at the lowest physiological level. I believe, although there's some issues on how this can be used, that the uh, proliferation of internet health websites ranging from things like PubMed, which is a National Institutes of Health uh, government website, to things like the Mayo Clinic, to commercial websites is generally a good thing for society because we can learn more about the conditions that we have or fear we might have. Uh, there are issues on how you take that knowledge and uh, engage your physician with it given the general lack of time uh, for most patients in Canada to spend time with their physicians. But still, it is a set of technologies that are used by everybody, but increasingly, particularly by uh, seniors, uh, that I think is generally for the good. There's another kind of internet technology that is relevant to health, and that's what you can call social media for health. Okay, the sites on the previous slide were sites by experts saying, okay, this is what this disease is. Here's how you understand it. Uh, social media for health sites are ones where people who are experiencing a particular condition, and here you see just something randomly picked by braintumorcommunity.org, people who have brain tumors or who fear they have brain tumors can discuss with other people what was it like, what was their experience. And again, this is a different kind of knowledge uh, that is increasingly relevant to people and seniors. Another area of technology that's increasingly relevant to seniors is um, uh, technology for physical fitness, particularly in climates such as ours, where you can't go out much for five months of the year. And so there is a technology, uh, there are many technologies now. The earliest entry in this that got a lot of traction was a <coughs> Silicon Valley company called Fitbit. And you can see an example of a Fitbit. That slide was, uh, that image was captured a year and a half ago. Now they have Fitbits of all sizes, shapes, colors, et cetera. They've almost become items of jewelry. And you wear a Fitbit and it monitors your activity and sends messages of one kind or another to you, to your doctor, to whoever that enables you to better track uh, how much activity you're having and uh, uh, with a view towards, towards better health. And I have friends who can tell me, one friend in particular, who has one of these treadmill desks and he's up at 5.30 uh, listening to uh, uh, classes from the internet while walking around Queens Park for an hour every morning. I don't know, does he do 40,000 steps a day, 400,000 steps a day? I can't keep up. Uh, uh, another area where, again, technology is uh, proving of interest to some seniors is an area of uh, being able to track uh, human body movements in a way that enables them to pretend they're doing things they're not actually doing. Okay, the original technology was the Nintendo Wii, now Microsoft has the Kinect and there are a host of other technologies. And the basic idea that if you're unable to go out to a bowling alley and you love bowling, you can either holding a bowling ball or not, as the case may be, uh, move your arm and your body as if you were bowling. And these technologies like Wii or Connect are tracking your motion and can display on the screen what would happen if you were actually doing this with a real bowling alley on a real uh, bowling lane. And of course, it's not the same as being there. I'm not going to 
say it's the same as being there. But if you can't get out to a bowling alley anymore, there are numbers of seniors that are finding this interesting. I'm now going to move on to safety needs. Uh, and I'm just going to show two slides in this area. In the upper left is uh, one of my favorite technologies developed by a brilliant uh, uh, engineer at the University of Washington named Schwetak Betzel. And Schwetak has developed ways, and I believe this is now being commercialized by a company in the States called the Belkin Company. Schwetak found a way to measure electrical flow and fluid flow on the electrical circuits of a house and the pipes in a house so that a computer uh, watching that could notice, for example, that historically in the circuit in the kitchen there's uh, uh, current flowing uh, every morning around 9 o'clock in two places, which if you know uh, how people live there, you can say, oh, that's the coffee pot and that's the toaster. And so what this computer monitoring uh, this could do, or it could be flushing toilets or running water in the kitchen or whatever, a computer could notice that hmm, uh, yesterday morning and this morning there's no electricity. Did they really go away uh, without telling us or is something more serious going on? And so this is an example of the kinds of monitoring that are referred to early in the talk in which uh, very smart, small technologies are watching to ensure that bad things happen or don't happen or discover when they're in the process of happening. And over here on the right you see uh, technology from Alex Michaelidis at uh, University of Toronto and Toronto Rehab who's one of the most brilliant researchers of this kind anywhere in the world. Um, who's experimenting with technology for fall detection that differs from the I've fallen and I can't go up, get up commercial technology which you either have to wear on your belt or carry with you because this doesn't, uh, you don't have to be carrying anything. Uh, there are real privacy issues to this because this is a video camera in the ceiling looking for silhouettes on the floor that correspond to someone having fallen over. And it's unclear even though uh, the technology, I believe, can be made very secure so that, uh, so that all you can see is silhouettes and it only goes to the, the security company and not broadcast on YouTube. Uh, uh, it's unclear whether this technology will be accepted. Another area that I find particularly fascinating, and I don't have time to do it in detail, is uh, the use of crowdsourcing to help people solve problems that they can't solve themselves. And the best example uh, of this is uh, the work of Jeff Bingham and his students now at Carnegie Mellon, in which blind people can take pictures with a camera or a cell phone of things they're going to encounter and send a little message over the internet saying, what's in front of me? Is this a, is this a bottle with a poison indicator on it? Uh, it looks like I'm approaching a transit stop is uh, the transit stop under construction? Am I going to trip? Uh, is there a bench with uh, people there or it's free? And this is at very early stages of research, but it's very interesting. Um, I'm now going to go to the third level in the hierarchy. I've covered physiological and safety. Uh, so now we're talking about the heart. Uh, this is an area that I got particularly interested in uh, because my sister Janet uh, passed away uh, about four years ago after a 15-year battle with MS. And when she was diagnosed with MS, uh, just before turning 50, she ran an epidemiology research group in the New Jersey Department of Public Health. Um, she was active in the synagogue. She played in a string quartet, and she had two children, teenage or almost teenage, who filled the house with their friends. In her last two years, she, had, she was totally socially isolated in a so-called rehab facility an hour and a half from her home where she had been taken because they had specific expertise or so we were led to believe uh, dealing, with, uh, dealing with MS, dealing with lung problems, some of the many things that upset her. Uh, her husband still drove in once a week from 
central New Jersey, her kids find it harder and harder to visit because of their busy lives and also the, the, how depressing it was. And I think there were only one or two friends from graduate school and from work who still managed to come visit her once every uh, three months or six months. And so I imagined that people were lying, 150 people in this place, mostly lying in their beds, typically two to a room, typically TVs blaring, often two different programs in the same room on opposite sides of the curtain. And I imagined the TV stopping and a voice coming saying, we interrupt this mindless dribble from CNN with a message from your son. Hi, Mom, it's Neil, thinking of you. Went golfing yesterday, shot three birdies. Now, I don't think my sister really cared about how many birdies her son did, but just the personal connection uh, seemed like it was a good idea. And so we started working on this, uh, and it's taken a lot of uh, 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 starts and stops. Uh, we realized fairly on that this was a much bigger problem than just someone in a rehab hospital with MS. And in fact, there's a lot of data now that if you look at seniors who are often socially isolated, these could be living alone. And they don't have to be living alone. They could be in a long-term care facility with lots of people around, but that's not the people they care about. They're, they're feeling isolated from their family. They could be people in long-term hospitalization. Um, I was staggered a few years ago to learn how many people have chronic pain in North America, which makes it harder for them to commit to a friend, I will meet you for lunch Thursday at noon, because they may wake up Thursday morning and their pain is so excruciating uh, they can't get out. And, um, and also 724 homebound care caregivers is another set of people who get very socially isolated. And there's, and there's now increasing research uh, with numbers like 43% of seniors being socially isolated and 43% being lonely. Uh, that's a coincidence. I mean, social isolation does not necessarily imply loneliness or vice versa. But why that magic number 43 comes out of data, I don't know. And in fact, social isolation kills. There's a meta-analysis that was published recently that looks at a 150 different studies that basically argues that on the average um, uh, you live 50% uh, longer if you're connected than if you're socially isolated. And I know I'm not making that very precise, but I don't have time to, to do a precision. Uh, so there's lots of technology out there. Uh, 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 how many here uh, who have grandchildren uh, Skype with or some uh, FaceTime with your grandchildren once a week. Okay, uh, so there are synchronous real-time chat technologies that address the problem. Uh, there are various kinds of mail clients that try to address the problem. Uh, but what we discovered is that the synchronous often have the difficulties of needing to schedule a meeting. And that can be very difficult if your kids uh, are never home because they're working day and night and then when they are home they're taking your grandchildren off to ballet class or violin lesson or soccer or whatever. Uh, and so uh, we also decided that we needed to understand the issues a little better so we've done a significant number of interview studies with home dwellers in chronic pain with patients in a complex continuing care hospital, with seniors in retirement residences, long-term care facilities, and home health care patients, which we did courtesy of great cooperation from Rivera Incorporated. And we learned a lot out of this that suggested how we could plausibly design technology that would be better. Uh, and one of the things we learned that for many seniors, not for all, maybe not for those of you in the room who Skype with your grandchildren every weekend, but for many seniors, uh, saying this is a computer uh, just scares them to death uh, because A, they think they can't do it, and B, they're afraid they're going to break it. Um, and uh, so what we built should feel like an appliance, not like a computer. It should leverage pictures of family members as much as possible. So immediately relate to the people you're trying to connect to. It should not be 
real-time chat. It should be asynchronous messaging. You send a message off and maybe your son or daughter or grandchild has the time to respond an hour later or a day later or whatever and other aspects of the technology. So what we built has been called In Touch. Um, and I'm going to show you a movie. Uh, the stars of this movie are uh, actors. and They've never acted before. They just did an amazing job. Some of you may know one of the actors actually lives in Hamilton. Uh, some of you may know her. Uh. I live on my own. My husband passed away about seven years ago. I have three children, but one's in England and one's in California, and I don't see them very much. And I hardly ever see my grandchildren. Even I've got two great grandchildren. I've just seen seen them once. And my daughter lives an hour away, but she's really busy. She has work and she has teenage kids and you know what that's like. You know, I don't want to be a burden to anyone, but I do get lonely. And when you're too lonely, it affects your physical health and your mental health. My mom doesn't have a cell phone and it's hard to do, you know, the, the regular kind of communication that you're used to. I've tried teaching my mother text messaging and email. It's never worked. Total failure. But now, I think there's something that's going to make a difference. Have I got a thing for you? There's a lot of people who are getting older, people like my mom, who are not comfortable with technology. This is a big problem because everybody else is on this information superhighway. And there's a lot of people waiting on the side. And they can't get on. So what is that? Computers. Not for me. I don't, I don't want it. No, no, no. I get just one more clutter. Uh, I can't do that. Just just take it and, and try it. Try it, please. She was not going to buy this. I'm not too old to do this. Then. She's afraid of technology. You tried with the email and you tried with the Twitter and the tweeting and the beeping. It just scares me, these things. I look at them and I'm just scared. I, I think I won't remember anything and I'll break it. It is really simple. It's one screen with four big buttons. You can wave and say hello. You can send a picture, a voicemail, or a video. And all she has to do is hit one button and done. If you want to just say hello, just push this. Done. What does that do? It says hello. It says hello to you? Yeah. Somewhere else? Yes. On my phone. That's it. One of the things you just wave, you can push a button and wave at somebody. That wasn't too bad. So let's take a picture. Look at this. Aw, they look good. Smile. Oh, that's good. Now we spin. There's a camera and you take pictures and then there's a sound, a microphone, and you can record a message. Hi John, it's Mom. How are you doing in England? I miss you. I wish you'd come and visit more often. And that's it. And you'll get that in England? Yeah. What is that? Okay. And this is never gonna work. This is never gonna work. She's very stubborn. She's set in her way. So I left it with her and I'm hoping she's gonna try. Fingers crossed. <sighs> Alright, for your sake I'll try it, but I really, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it is not gonna work. Well, when she first brought it over, you know, I just said I can't do this, this isn't for me. <laughs> and then, you know, I decided I would do it. So one day I opened it up, and Anna had put some pictures of my family, and I thought, well, I'll try that wave thing. It's actually pretty simple. You don't have to have all those keyboards and things that the other computers have. And then they wrote back to me. I could see messages from them. Well, that was pretty good. It went really well. She used it. She liked it. My mother is happy. She's communicating with my faraway brothers and the kids. The grandchildren are so cute. You know, I really can see what they're doing. I, they were growing so fast, I didn't even know what they looked like. But now I can see them at two and two and a half. I really get a sense that my family's all around me now. Let me try the camera. That's easy. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try the microphone. Hi, sweetie. Thanks for that message you sent. And give my love to your children. They're such sweet little things. It's much easier for me now because I know she's not all by herself and lonely at home. Hi, Ancestor. I love you. I miss you. Hope to see you soon. 
Hi, Anne. It's Mom. You know, I never thought I could use this thing he sent me, but it's wonderful. Hi, Anne. It's Mom. You know, I never thought I could use this thing he sent me, but it's wonderful. I see talking to everybody in the family. I can see their pictures. It's great. Yeah, I never thought I could do technology. And look at me. Here I am above me. I'm doing technology. Hey, Mom. I'm so glad that you're enjoying this. I knew you could do it. I'll see you later. Love you. Bye. Mm -hmm. You know, the other nice thing about this thing, it actually reminds me about things. Today it said it's your great-granddaughter's second birthday. Oh, and there's one more thing. It, it tells me about my medicines. So I don't have to write everything down on pieces of paper, because I lose the pieces of paper. And then even exercise. There's a little gadget, and it'll remind me if I'm not walking around enough. The device communicates with the activity monitor that she wears. And if suddenly she starts to become less active, we'll get notified. I worry less about my mother now because I can see her activity. Mom, well, you're doing so great with this. Remember I said I couldn't do it? And now look at me. It's really changed my life, you know that. I'm much less lonely. I used to sit at home and just drink my coffee and do the crossword puzzle. It would be a very long day. And now I find I'm busy all the time. She is a different person. It's really amazing. She's really liberated. Oh, look at her there. Isn't that sweet? Aww. Oh, I'm so glad you showed me how to use this. I'm really proud of myself for learning this. You know, I'm going to recommend this to my friends. Lots of families are moving away these days, and they're all kind of in the same boat. With the growing elderly population, this kind of technology is really valuable. It's been a life changer. Uh, just a couple other uh, comments about that. First of all, the, the device you saw is this device, which is what we were using uh, until now, so-called the Android tablet. Now we're, we've moved it to iOS, the Apple technology, and that can work uh, uh, primarily we're using these 7-inch mini iPads, but it also would work on a 10-inch iPad and also, for that matter, on a high-end iPhone, although we haven't had a chance to test it yet. Um, testing is very important, and I don't actually have any slides on that here. Um, we are to testing this as thoroughly as possible, so we've just finished, although we haven't analyzed all the data yet, uh, probably the toughest testing environment we could have imagined. We didn't consciously choose it. Rivera said to us, um, why don't you work at Leeside and Kennedy Lodge, and it turned out mainly Kennedy Lodge. Not only was Kennedy Lodge an hour and a half away from the university by transit, none of my students, I mean, not only don't they have cars, they don't even know how to drive, uh, but uh, it was an environment uh, that probably you would say is not necessarily the best environment for seniors, four beds to a room, uh, we had to chain down the technology for fear it would be stolen. Everybody speaks Chinese, Cantonese, and luckily we had one student who spoke enough Cantonese to, so she was our prime interface. And the average age of 87, every, everyone has multiple chronic diseases, and none of them had ever used a computer before. So despite that, we got some encouraging insights and also lots of specific insights into things we needed to do better when we wrote the next version of the program for this. Uh, and uh, at the end of January, we're starting a uh, hopefully much larger trial with somewhere between 12 and 30 people, depending on uh, financing, um, at a place called Christie Gardens, which is a independent living, assisted living, long-term care facility, but mainly independent and assisting, uh, that's quite close to the University of Toronto, has a lot of University of Toronto emeritus profs living there, and where uh, the staff seem to have enough time that they'll be able to participate a little bit with us, although we know we can't put a lot of load on the staff. And so we went there uh, uh, two weeks ago to introduce the project to some of the residents and were blown away. And it wasn't advertised for very long. We were blown away. There were 40 people there whom half of them signed up to be 
research participants, and we have another session scheduled for next Monday. And because of the the nature of Christie Gardens, which has been developed by a wonderful lady named Grace Wetman, who has seven of her ten children and, um, uh, and partners of children working in the place, we have huge support from the staff. And so it's going to be very important for the study. Uh, we hope by spring and summer to expand the study populations beyond those two places to include Sunnybrook Veterans Hospital, which wants to uh, try this out, as well as several care facilities in the uh, Waterloo Kitchener area, uh, where we're working with Professor Verdi Moskar at Princeton College, who used to be in Toronto Rehab. Um, okay, and we've actually formed a company to try to bring this to the marketplace called Family Net. Um, now I want to go to the esteem level, and here I'm going to go through things very quickly. Uh, the first thing we looked at uh, a number of years ago, well, it wasn't actually the first, but one thing that was particularly interesting was helping people speak. And we were we started this uh, looking at people who had had strokes and who had aphasia. And so the idea that uh, my student Alex Levy developed into something called My Voice was that because your cell phone, a smartphone, knows where you are, it could not only give you words that might be uh, useful for you to say, it could tailor those words that are displayed on the screen to a particular location. So if you were in a Tim Hortons, it would give you Tim Bits and Double Double and uh, things like that. And if you were in a movie theater, it would give you ticket and washroom and theater and um, uh, start time and things like that. Uh, and it could be used in one of two ways. If you're able to articulate the words, then it simply gives you words and phrases on the screen and pictures. Uh, but if you can't, it can actually use a voice synthesizer to speak out the words. Uh, and this um, uh, turned into a company that we spun out about three years ago called My Voice Inc. And their product now is called Talk, Rock, and Go. Uh, the next area that we started to think about was helping people re- oh, and the My Voice is not only relevant to seniors, but it's being used by kids with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, people uh, with cerebral problem palsy, et cetera, et cetera. The next area we wanted to work on was helping people read. And um, um, I don't, I'm not going to show you the movie uh, that we developed, uh, but, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll show you a couple of minutes. I'll show you a minute of it. Okay, so this is an early prototype of. ALK is an app that helps people read by themselves and together with family members. Like an electronic large print book, type can be enlarged for individuals whose vision is poor. It can also be shown on a high-def display or a TV for family viewing. Like books on tape, the text is read aloud for people who are blind. She is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. the voice. It is actually, this is not just for pre-recorded books, it was but for any digitized text. Alt is accessible to people with motor challenges such as occurs in MS and Parkinson's. It can be controlled by this mobile keyboard or a connected keyboard that also provides a stand for the iPad. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were important to his cold, precise but admirably balanced mind. Alt can also access a million books via the Internet Archive. So let's pick the category Children's Literature English, and we find Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and we'll download that. Family members can read books aloud to Alt users. Readings are recorded and can later be heard by the user. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the bora groves, and the mome rats outgrave. Jabberwifty. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the 
Uh, so the idea is if you want to read to somebody who can't read by themselves, the device can record the reading and then if someone is trying to read it, um, if it's been a part that's been recorded, and the fellow who did this for Xavier Snellgrove used to read to his uh, grandmother, um, if Xavier had recorded something, then his grandmother could hear his voice. And if he hadn't, then it would use a traditional uh, uh, voice synthesizer. Um, the last um, topic I want to talk about briefly, and I apologize for going through these so quickly, but um, is in the area of esteem is remaining cognitively fit and avoiding cognitive decline. And if you recall um, uh, my distinction fairly early in the talk between technologies that are diagnostic or prosthetic or rehabilitative or preventative, there's huge hope and hype now associated with what are called brain training exercises, brain fitness games. Uh, and the idea is that in the same way that um, you could, by continuing to jog, keep your uh, legs and abdomen and everything else healthier and perhaps be able to walk longer, the hope is that by training your brain with these exercises, your brain will stay cognitively fit longer and maybe you can hold off Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see here uh, brain trained, scientifically designed, help delay Alzheimer's, brain fitness for life, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's become a huge industry. Uh, so the question is, can we in fact delay mental aging? Uh, and there's the good news and the bad news. The good news is that uh, the new, relatively new science of neuroplasticity says that the brain is far more plastic and resilient than we used to think. And for example, if someone suffered a brain injury, and you've seen examples in the last few years of political figures, uh, both in the US and abroad, who suffered serious brain injury, who um, have or are recovering in one way or another. Uh, and so the brain is, is, is plastic, and you think that with brain training, maybe the brain becomes stronger. Now, what does it mean to be stronger? Uh, in the research literature on this, there's a phrase called cognitive reserve, which is associated primarily with um, Professor Jakob Stern at Columbia Medical School, and I had the privilege of visiting his lab for five months about six years ago. And what Jakob and hundreds of researchers have found is that over a lifetime, if you've gone to Harvard or Yale or McMaster as opposed to being having a high school education. If you've worked as a professor or a graphic designer as opposed to uh, a convenience store clerk. If you've gotten lots of exercise as opposed to being a couch potato. If you've uh, had lots of friends as opposed to being a hermit. If you've eaten a Mediterranean diet as opposed to going to McDonald's every night. If you had a bilingual education early in life, as opposed to a unilingual education, you have probably built up more cognitive reserve. And cognitive reserve means that uh, people with more cognitive reserve who have a certain set of plaques and tangles can better withstand those plaques and tangles and not express Alzheimer's disease than people with less cognitive reserve. Okay. But there's relatively little evidence that says if you start doing uh, crossword puzzles every day or playing Lumosity brain fitness games every day at age 60 or age 70, this is really going to have substantial benefit other than if you do crossword puzzles every day, you'll be better at crossword puzzles. There's relatively little evidence of transfer and training. Uh, it's not, there's not no evidence in the two best studies of this kind have been done, I think uh, Ball et al. is in Alabama or Mississippi, and Winoker et al. is at Baycrest in Toronto. So there are some research studies that would give us hope. But in general, this has been more hype than true hope. That's not to say if you love someone's brain training games, by all means do them. They cost almost nothing. Not going to harm you uh, unless you get uh, uh, whatever that. 
carpal tunnel syndrome, by all means, do them. Um, I'm going to skip over the next slide and now go on to the last section of the talk. Okay, and this is self-actualization. I'm not sure that these two examples fit very well under self-actualization, so I'm not sure I understand self-actualization as well as I should. But um, here are the examples. And the first one is the project, one of the projects that I'm proudest of that I did together with Professor Elsa Marziali, who was just recently retired from Baycrest. She was an endowed chair in social work. And the idea was that, uh, that as people develop Alzheimer's, uh, it becomes harder and harder for them to essentially re-envision re and recapture what life was like when they were younger. And it also becomes harder and harder for family members to do this because they're so burdened with just the, with the burden of care. And so Elsa's hypothesis, and she had done a little pilot project at Baycrest, was that uh, if we could create a motion picture that essentially represented the story of your life, uh, and showed that repeatedly or when interested to people at various stages of dementia, uh, that this might be beneficial. And so we did uh, uh, what was really a very tiny study, even though it took us three and a half years working with 12 people. And so we had two goals. One was to show that the technique uh, was effective, and the second was to show that it was practical. In other words, you can think of Gone with the Wind as the story of Scarlett O'Hara's life, and we didn't want to, um, I mean, actually, actually, the budget for Gone with the Wind wasn't that high given the complexity, uh, but uh, you don't want uh, to need a professional film crew. So I'm gonna just show you two quick examples. This is a lady with mid-stage Alzheimer's who was brought to Toronto from South Africa by her, um, uh, her children after her second husband passed away. Oh. I live there. Yeah, you do. there, but also she remembers feelings. It was very good to live there. What we discovered was that uh, it was interesting to have, and we worked with people who had mild cognitive impairment and early stage Alzheimer's primarily, and a little bit mid-stage Alzheimer's. Uh, we're not at all sure that this would be effective with late stages of Alzheimer's. Uh, that this was far more powerful if you watched with a family member. So here you see Ms. Zed watching with her daughter, and her daughter's uh, chatting with her about it, but also her daughter is the narrator of the motion picture, so you'll see her speaking in two different ways. This is you in one of Brown's suits. Really a stunning suit. What an excellent couturier designer he was. It's very important to my daughter. Here you are looking so beautiful. Catherine Hepburn, you can like enjoy uh, viewing the story of their life, not always. Um, sometimes you see a photograph of someone who's passed away. Um, we've, actually, uh, we've actually counted the number of instances of joy as opposed to the sadness we see in 
people watching this and it's something like 15 to 1. Um, uh, group viewing is very helpful for stimulating family conversation and in the case of two individuals who live in a long-term care facility, seeing the story of the life of the people they were taking care of um, uh, made a difference because now they have some personal information. This is all part of a, uh, a, a school of work called Reminiscence Therapy, and this follows in the line of, I should have mentioned this earlier, Reminiscence Therapy, but I think we've got something new for this. Um, the, uh, the other topic that relates to the soul, I guess, self-actualization, is thinking about the end of, the, the end of life. I had a, a brilliant and very courageous PhD student named Mike Massimi, who did a PhD thesis from about uh, six years ago to two years ago on what he called thanatosensitive design, design of technology that acknowledged the fact that we were not going to be here forever and that might be relevant towards people in end stages of life. And as an example of thanatosensitive design, this is my friend Kathy Kastner, who has a website called bestendings.com, which is designed to provide information and I hope ultimately community for people interested in thinking about uh, the end of life in a more uh, structured way. We've learned a lot of lessons from this work. Um, when we started it, uh, about the lab was named in 2008, but I started the work in 2001. Um, we thought we were building cognitive prostheses, memory aids, and we realized over the year that the opportunities are far much greater, um, both in terms of it's not just prosthetics, it could be rehabilitation, um, it could be diagnosis, it could be prevention, and it's not just memory, it's a whole range of cognitive and sensory and motor and social um, uh, challenges. Uh, for seniors. It's very multidisciplinary work. I was talking with people here before. It sounds like you, you, you guys really live and breathe multidisciplinary work here at McMaster, unlike U of T, which pays lip service to it, but then just puts barriers in the way. Uh, and you can quote me on that on the video. Uh, uh, and the other thing to be said is, as I said earlier, we can't do this work in a laboratory. We have to get our prototypes good enough so that we can actually give it to real seniors living in their real home environments or residential environments, doing the things that they normally do. And this, this is a great challenge. The payoff, I, uh, I assert, is that although we can't all be active in our 80s and 90s in a way that is as significant to the world as people like Nelson Mandela and Gorbachev and Picasso and, and uh, Casals and just uh, Christopher Plummer here. So we have some Canadian content in this slide. Uh, I believe the kinds of technologies we're developing can help seniors not live longer, uh, but uh, well, actually, maybe live longer if the data is correct that by connected live longer, then yes, live longer and also live happier, healthier, more productive and more fulfilling lives. So thanks for your attention. I think I went a little longer than I hoped, but uh, hopefully it's okay. And I'm here to answer questions as long as you have questions to ask. So.